Um, thanks everyone for, for making it out here and braving the pretty severe weather we had this morning. Uh, my pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker, uh, Dave Lifka from Cornell University. Um, Dave is the director of, for the Center of Advanced Computing at Cornell, and he's going to be speaking with us about a sustainable business model for advanced research computing. Thank you, Dave. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I'm for, I'd like to start by thanking Steve and Ian, who aren't here, unfortunately, because of the weather, but I really appreciate the opportunity to, have this, to speak with you today. Um, please interrupt me anytime you want if you have questions. Um, what I wanted to do is sort of give you an overview of, of the center and sort of our model. And um, one topic that's come up over and over yesterday, and, and I'm sure will continue to come up today, is sustainability. Um, with the, the budget the way it is and things people are worried about this more and more. And I think one of the advantages of, of Globus Online is it provides a great stable service that we can build other services on. And that's very similar to the model I'm going to talk about that we built at Cornell. So hopefully this um, inspires you to have some other ideas or questions. So um, I don't usually put my resume up, but this is a homecoming for me. Um, I worked here for 10 years. I was an undergrad in, in uh, Illinois Benedictine College just down the road. And it really is, this is the first time I've been back here since I left 17 years ago. So it's, it's amazing to see how Argonne has changed for the better. This beautiful facility wasn't here. It was woods with white deer running around on it when I was here and people with mountain bikes like me riding. Um, but I did a lot of odd jobs all related to computing. Um, um, the petabyte access project was actually the super collider, which was, as you know, didn't last very long. Um, but I, I worked all the way up until I ended up with the math and computer science department. Where, and, and Argonne paid for all of my graduate school, and my PhD was actually building the scheduler that is now built into most schedulers today. The better backfill algorithm and the heterogeneous backfill algorithm was, was my dissertation. So in um, 95, I left home. I grew up right up the street in Clarendon Hills. Um, and I went to Cornell, which was a big shock. My family was, uh, is still all here, and I'm staying with my father in Plainfield right now. Um, and when I got there uh, to Cornell, it looked great. Um, beautiful facilities, it's a beautiful university, um, but they didn't have a very sustainable model. And so, um, just to give you a couple other quick plugs here, I'm also the chair of CASC. This is the Coalition for Academic Scientific Computation. It's a group of over 70 people like myself that meet uh, three times a year, twice in Washington and once at Supercomputing, to talk about these sorts of issues. So if your institution isn't a member, you should think about it. Um, I can give you more information. And um, actually, because of Exceed, I'm really here. I've been acting as the coordinator for architecture, um, who Ian and, Ian and Steve are both architects for Exceed. There's Ian. Good morning, Ian. Um, his boat just arrived. So, <laughs> so, um, so anyway, um, when I, we really, this is a picture of Cornell, um, so it's not New York City. A lot of people here in New York and assume Manhattan. It's not um, high above Cayuga waters. There's a song. Some say there comes an awful smell, but we won't go there. Um, right in front is the advanced computing building, and that's Cayuga Lake behind. Um, and when we got there, um, we had, when I got there, we were one of the four national supercomputing centers at the time, so San Diego, Pittsburgh, NCSA, and Cornell. And, and, and actually, NCAR was one too, but somehow they, I don't know how they got classified. But I got there right at the end of the NSF mission for the Theory Center. And they had this nifty funding model thing where you would, you know, you uh, either had plenty of funding or you had none. And so I, when I got there, we were at about 120 people, and I was a systems programmer, band to the fourth floor of the building where the lowly systems programmers sat. And, um, and it was fun, um, but then two years later, we went to 20 people um, when we lost our funding. And um, that was great, and I had some ideas um, with the other 19 people that were left on how to do some interesting things, and we were doing... Um, a lot of work with Intel-based systems. We were moving off of the IBM SP because we simply couldn't afford it at the time. And um, don't throw rotten fruit, but we started working with Microsoft, and we actually helped them get into the HPC game. So a lot of the, if you, recent years at supercomputing, you saw the big Microsoft float. Todd Needham got us started, and we worked with him. And so the peak went up, not nearly quite as high, but it was substantial, and we grew again. And then that mission ended, and then we said, 
no more. I can't take it anymore. This up and down is no fun. And so we really wanted a sustainable model where you had lots of modest funding streams that could sustain um, a reasonable size core for a given mission. And so that's where, we're, that's where we started. That was the premise. So, you know, um, basically what happened was after the Microsoft mission, I was looking for a new job, and the provost called me in and said, I heard you're looking, and I said, yeah. I said, I'm tired of that roller coaster. And she said, yeah, um, so I want you to help us fix it. And I said, okay. So she says, well, you know, what are the problems? What are the costs? What are the things you're worried about? And you've all seen these lists. So I said, you know, staff is the big one, right? Then on our $2 million a year budget, which is modest by many standards, but, but big to compare to others, um, th over three quarters of that is just staff. So um, how do you pay them and how do you make sure, in a recovery model, how do you pay them? And it's not just their paycheck, it's their benefits, their, for, you know, all that. And it comes out of your budget. Um, computing is an obvious one. I'm gonna tell you some stories about computing. Um, and our shift to cloud computing, um, and why we chose the, the, the resource that we did that might surprise you. Data storage and archive um, actually turns out to be the big hot topic, as you, you could guess, and, then, and this is actually um, why Globus Online is so important to us. It's funny, because uh, yesterday during Ian's keynote, he said it was sort of like a Dropbox for science, and two years ago he sent me an email and he said, hey Dave, have you heard of Globus Online? And he, Check out this website, and so I looked, and I said, is it like Dropbox? <laughs> and he said, no, not quite, but, but I think it's gotten a lot closer to Dropbox now, and I think that's important, especially with the sharing capability. Um, networking is, is, a, is a huge expense, especially if you, are, you, know, you want 10 gig connectivity outside, um, visualization, and then facilities. So we heard you know, from, from Michigan yesterday that they have to pay for facilities. Luckily, we don't have to do that. Um, it comes out of indirect, but not every institution has that luxury. Um, and then you have the, the sort of technology infrastructure game, which is, you know, the technology constantly changes. You buy three terabyte drives today, and next week they have four terabyte drives, and the following week five terabyte drives, and you can't keep up. And, you, you know, so you try to find this sweet spot where you can sustain uh, a recovery model. It's expensive. And the, the thing that I want to, to, to really uh, pound home is that it's certainly a Cornell one size does not fit all. So standing up a large cluster and telling everyone to buy into it, I'd be out on my ear day one. They would not buy into that. Um, and so I'll tell you a little bit about what they do, and you're gonna go, that's crazy, but I'll tell you how we sort of built a model around what they wanted. Um, and so you really have to go out, you have to get off your butt, and you have to go out and visit with the faculty and the researchers, and you have to find out what they need. And I, I don't wanna pretend that what we did at Cornell is right for your institution, it's not. You have to do this yourself, and you have to do this exercise yourself. Um, and then you have, you know, funding opportunities. In the past, the Theory Center was used to leading. They were a big center. We're going to lead proposals. We had to move into a model, well, let's partner. We have some strengths. We can bring value. Partnering is a good thing. And you, and you still bring in, uh, again, that, that modest funding, but at a steady state. Um, and then the other thing that's really important for strategic planning, and again, this is uh, an opportunity where Globus helps, is campus bridging to national cyber infrastructure. How do you move your data? in and out. Cornell's not going to have a 10,000 core cluster. They're going to run on Stampede. They're going to run at Oak Ridge. They're going to run on Blue Waters. So how do you help them do that? And that's what we really focus on. And we don't view that as a bad thing. Okay, so the provost called me in. We met with, I met with, this is like six years ago. I met with the provost, the vice, various vice provost uh, deans, and, and some representative faculty, who some of them don't like me anymore. Um, and that's okay, because they were sort of old school and had been getting things for free for 20 years, and then we said, uh, get your wallet out, and then they, yeah, you know, what's that? We're gonna march, we're gonna march in front of Day Hall, I tell you, and go ahead. So, um, so you know, what we had to do is really uh, look at the costs, understand where they were, and what we were doing previous to having a recovery model, and then we had to have discussions with the faculty about what they really wanted, and the, the measure here was what were they willing to pay for. So the famous thing is if you go to any scientist and you say, how much computing power do you need or how much storage do you need, they'll give you some you know, huge number. And then you say, how much would you be willing to pay for that? Now how much do you need? And then all of a sudden it shrinks. And so putting a price on services, any price, quickly right-sizes it. And that's what happened at Cornell. Um, and it doesn't mean that we're not doing 
good science and we're not getting funding. Last year, Cornell was the highest award winner of NSF grants. So not just in computing, but things that use computing, okay? So we had these discussions. They weren't easy. Many of them were very heated. And what we really had to do was to seek economies of scale and scope. We knew we couldn't do all the things that we had under a large NSF budget or under a healthy Microsoft budget. We had to really focus in on what, just what the faculty wanted and what they were paying for. And we were only going to retain the staff and services that the faculty were willing to pay for. So we had to right size. Now, this isn't going from 120 to 20 like I told you about earlier, but this is getting to the right size that we thought we could sustain long term. Okay? Um, so Cornell ha uh, had this model already called the core facility model. So anyone providing services, basic services for research on campus, falls under a core facility. So this is people that do sequencing, that run the sequencers, they're a core facility. Um, people that run other instruments or other labs, like the nanotech lab, nanofab lab, all core facilities, they have to charge, and the goal for all of them is 80% cost recovery. So they get some indirect back, some provost subsidy, and the reason is, the provost knows that it's essential to encourage centralization for cost avoidance. If, you don't, if you're not cheaper than their grad students, the faculty won't come, right? And then you have this problem where they're popping up data centers and closets where they don't belong instead of using the centralized resources. So the, the subsidy actually saves money. It's really hard to quantify. That's the problem. So if you said, well, you know, measure cost avoidance, that's almost impossible. But every dean will tell you that it's so because they'll tell you, I won't give the faculty money to build a data center, but I will give them money to run in your data center because the costs are right. Um, and, the, and people said, well, okay, um, I don't have any money this year, so you're starting this new thing and you're going to charge me for what I use. I don't have any money. I didn't plan for this. I didn't write it into my grants. I can't write it into my grants. That was famous, too. Um, it's amazing how many of the new faculty do. Um, and, but, so what the dean said is, we're going to provide bridge funding to those faculty members to use your services. And so there was, earlier on in the discussions, there was, well, why don't we just give like a flat tax? Every, every college pays a flat tax, and then we have the service, and we give it to everybody. And the engineering dean was like, no way. No way, because I'm not paying, using my money to cover someone in arts who's going to use it very differently than I am. I, if I'm going to give money to the faculty to use a resource, I want them to be supporting my faculty. So they really wanted this sort of <coughs> transparent model where they knew where their money was going. So, you know, the keys to the model is that it has to be institutionalized. If you say we're going to have a centralized service and it's cost recovery, and you say to the faculty, but you know, you can have your own data center and you can do this and you can do that, forget it. It's not going to work. So you really, it really had to be institutionalized, which is why it was so important that I had the attention of the deans and vice provost and, and, and the provost. Um, and you have to be able to enable a broad array of research. So one metrics of success that we use is how many new faculty, how many new users do we have every year? And it's been constantly growing for six years. That's important because if you're not and you're a centralized service and you only touch a small fraction of the campus, then you have to revisit that model and say, maybe it's just those few departments should be paying for it and not everybody. So efficient and fair is obvious. Economies of scale and scope, the trick there is understanding broadly how you can apply infrastructure, a certain type of infrastructure, and let different people do different things on top of it. So again, the model was we provide pro foundational resources that people can build other services on top of, and I'll give you some concrete examples of that in a minute. And then again, we, we knew we were not going to play a game where, we were ba where being successful was based on winning a major grant. So early on, the faculty said, oh, no problem. We'll just go out and get a Nobel Prize winner to be the center director, and we'll win all the big grants, and happy days will be here again at Cornell. And everyone shook their heads and said, no way. It's, you know, it's not, first of all, it's not going to happen getting that kind of a person here. And second of all, the funding is too tight. It's not gonna work. It doesn't work that way. So we now have a documented model. It's a, you know, the, everybody signed off on it. Um, the one thing is that it has to be, it has to allow for strategic change. It's not, it has to evolve. What we started six years ago has evolved dramatically since we started. I'll talk about that. And you have to allow for growth at, at the right level and adaptation. Um, the other key thing here is that you can't retain good staff if people are worried about their jobs every day. So you have to, you know, the sustainability lets you retain good staff. It's really important. 
Okay, so this is my slide when I go to faculty lunches and say, what is the Center for Advanced Computing and what do you do? And the reason I wanted to show this is not to show you our service catalog, but rather to highlight what we do and what we don't do based on my earlier slide. So we have consulting. Remember I said that staff was the highest, the, the biggest part of my budget? It is, and it turns out it's the most valuable asset the center has. If I had to pick one resource and not have any infrastructure at all, it would be my staff. We're written into many grants for optimization, parallelization, data analysis, workflows, on and on and on. All the things that you know that researchers want help with, and they're willing to write us into their grants to get that help. So very sustainable, we have a very broad portfolio, and every staff member is expected to bill 75 to 80% of their time. We know there'll be gaps, and, and, and it, it helps every, it, it, um, the funding that other people bring in help cover the gaps for others, but they have to be on that track. Um, and so we help with proposals, we help with startup packages. Um, you'll notice that we help with desktop and remote visualization, but there's no visualization service. And the reason is nobody was willing to pay for it. We had people that were using it like crazy. And we had two dedicated visualization, really good people. And they, and they said, well, can't you write them into their grants? No. Can't you give them some support? No. Well, th th this was great. Uh, development came and said, you can't turn off the cave. All the Boy Scout troops go through that. And I said, well, great. Give us some money to run it. Oh, we don't have any money. So, you know, we had to cut some of that stuff. Was, it, was that a good thing? No, not necessarily. No one wanted to cut that stuff, but it wasn't something that faculty were willing to pay for. Now, again, remember, I'm talking about Cornell. If I'm a national facility, I'd be singing a different song. I'm not. I'm a Cornell resource, okay? Um, and, and the other thing that, they, that we had was K through 12 outreach. We had this great program for reaching kids and teaching them about science. Again, every faculty member wrote it into their grant and drew a circle around it, how they were gonna do broadening participation and yada, 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 and not one of them was willing to pay a dime for it. So that had to go. So when we talked about right-sizing the staff, that's what we meant. Now, that's awful, right? That's not what you want. It turns out other opportunities start to come up when you get things right and you build on it. Um, data storage and management. So we, this is one of our big success stories. Um, I'll plug DDN here. At first, I didn't believe that we could afford a DDN, um, and I'll tell you more about that, but storage is important, and you have to have storage that's extremely flexible. One size, again, does not fit all, and I'll show you, tell you more about that. And connectivity is important, and being able to move data in and out. So again, Globus Online, essential. And then we, formed, we, we got involved in partnerships. So um, this is two recent ones. We've been involved in others. We were also part of the Ranger Grant but we're, we have long-standing web-based training called the Virtual Workshop at Cornell that was developed by Susan Maringer. It's still going strong, and it's one of the two offerings on Exceed today. Um, and then um, <clears throat> we're also doing that for Stampede, and we were doing that for Ranger. So we got involved in grants. We, got some, we have a steady state funding for things that we do well. N no, it's not running big machines or some of the sexy stuff, but it's things that we do well. And people say, well, how does that help Cornell? I'll tell you how. If we're training the nation on how to use these resources and we're sitting in Ithaca, guess what researchers have the best access to us? All right, so it works out well. Um, the other interesting thing is, so we have computing and you see subscriptions for Red Cloud and you see private cluster maintenance. You don't see shared computing. We just turned our last cluster off. We have thousands of servers in our machine room. They're all privately owned by the faculty because they don't want to share, but they need a model where they can maintain those at a low cost. So entry level, server one in your cluster is $2,500 a year. Your 1,000th server, it's 25,000 a year for 1,000 server. servers, not cores. So we have lots of clusters and the faculty love it. And they're growing it and they, it's not that we don't have condos because what happens is groups of faculty get together and pool their money because the more nodes in a single cluster with a single system image, the cheaper the model is, okay? So um, I'll talk more about Red Cloud. Um, that's really uh, one of the important messages uh, that I want to talk about. But the private cluster maintenance is, is an uh, important one. And the thing that we're working on now, so I also am the director for research computing at Weill Cornell Medical College, which is in Manhattan. And so HIPAA compliance is a big thing. And so we're actually now extending the firewall, and I'll show you this in a minute, um, to support HIPAA data in Ithaca. And I'll tell you why we're doing that. Okay. So yesterday someone raised a good issue.
great, 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 you have a great recovery model, but how are you going to innovate? And how are you going to, how are you going to do new things and interesting things? You know, boring, you're a service facility, right? And it turns out we're doing better than ever. Um, and the reason is vendors know that we more, we more closely track what businesses are doing, and guess where the volume market is? It's not in academia. So running a core facility that runs much like a small business or even medium-sized business is important. So they're coming to us and asking us for how to, how to solve certain problems for certain types of research and then applying those things to other things that they can turn into sales stories. Um, so we've actually grown and we've got partnership. Lots of these are just a small number, but we've actually, you'll see, gotten some awards for some of the work we've done, which is in turn brought in funding. And it's the kind of funding, that I, my favorite kind of funding, it's the kind of funding that comes in through a corporate memberships uh, program, and we can spend it on anything, people, hardware, and my hardware budget, by the way, is zero. I have a zero dollar hardware budget per year. That, this innovation, that money that comes in for that is how we buy hardware, and the recovery for existing hardware that we bought when we started things. Um, so the other thing, too, is um, you have to choose your partners wisely, and it's not just about shopping. It's also talking to your customers and understanding what they need and getting them involved in the process. So you have to not only understand what they want, but how much they're willing to pay for and balance it and work with the vendors. And so we've done that. Okay, so here's my DDN story, um, which we've been really happy with, but I never thought we'd be able to do. Five years ago, we bought um, a 9900, I think it was, and Kate with five drawers, and we got a really good entry-level deal. It was, we were really thrilled. But on the price of it was ballpark uh, 170, 75K, okay? I didn't have, I had my hardware budget was zero. So I went door to door and I said to the faculty, you're buying these drives at Best Buy, they're breaking, I know what's happening, what do we do? And they said, well, we need, we need to get storage at $1,000 a terabyte in an enterprise solution where it won't break. <clears throat> and I said, okay, if I can do that, um, will you sign up day one and will you commit to buying it ongoing? And so what I did was I knew the capacity of the device, day one, with the initial config, and I said I knew what I had to have half of it sold day one, and I went around and I basically took orders, and until I had half, I said, no can do. It didn't take long, and I had it, and now the device has been doubled in capacity and we're looking on adding another one. Now you're thinking, big deal, a few hundred terabytes. For Cornell, that's a big deal, right? We're not a national center, we're a Cornell-only center. So the thing that we like about it is, again, it has this great economies of scale and scope because it's so flexible. So you can add these drawers, and I, 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 t I try to explain this to people. So think of a tape library with slots for tapes. That's all these drawers are, okay? So we'll let you buy slots in the drawers, and you can buy your own drives, or we'll, we'll buy drives and let you pay per gigabyte. So we have a lot of flexibility there. You can buy your own drawer if you want. Um, and we've got all the price structure broken down. And then you have your controllers that everybody shares, and so the price of drawers and slots and everything else has to have a fraction of those controllers. But it turns out to be not very much when you spread it off or across enough storage. Then you have an InfiniBand switch, and then you can do whatever you want. So we provide two shared file servers that people can share, but the beauty of it is everyone can add their own file servers. So if they have their own dedicated cluster, they can add Lustre on top of it. They can buy their own file servers. The Life Sciences wanted a large single namespace, so they added Gluster, and that's actually, we got the Red Hat 2012 Innovation Award. Um, and we're nationally recognized just for that. He sounds like, that's no big deal. Well, no one had done that. So there's huge single namespace for the sequencing data. Um, and so that was really important. And you can see we're using it for all kinds of stuff. EBS, Elastic Block Storage for Red Cloud, um, Globus Online Endpoints, Grid FTP servers hang off of it. And then what's happened now is we've paid for the device. We've recovered all the costs of that device and the support staff to run it, which is minimal. And we're now filling the slots with three terabyte drives, which are on discount right now. So go see George at the end of the meeting and he'll give you a good dis discount. But basically, in July, we're launching archival storage that's going to be $100 a terabyte per year in the DDN. And um, we thought we were going to do S3, and we, um, that's what we wanted to do because we wanted to be compatible with Glacier, and we wanted to be able to, what we've been telling people is, if you need, or you don't do backup, by the way, if you want backup, that's 2,500 a terabyte through central IT. We don't, we don't want to play that game. So we told them to put your second copy in Glacier for 120 a terabyte year, but don't touch it. Because as soon as you pull it out, that's when you're really going to pay. But put it there for disaster. 
and then access the one in here. So we looked around and around, and I, we called the various vendors, and everyone said, well, I said, what's the best S3 game? And they all said, OpenStack. And then, I, and then they whispered in my ear, said, don't do it. They said, it's a disaster. They said, San Diego has a whole team of people that make it work. I have a staff of five that would have to make it work. So if I have to spend that kind of staff effort, rates start going up, I'm no longer $100 a terabyte per year. Globus Online has been rock solid. We've never had a problem. So we're just using Globus Online as our front end, and we're letting people park data. And they're perfectly happy with that because it performs, and they know where to get their data, they get the directory structure, they get it. It's easy. So that's our archival solution for the, for the near term, and we're really happy with it. So the other thing that we're starting to look at is um, remote second copies of critical data from the medical school. So how do you do that? Well, the interesting thing you can do, and we're actually looking at, is that IB switch can go to a server that has a 10 gig network connection that's on a secure network. So you can split at the IB port, and since that's in a secure data center, you can actually share the DDN. You parse out the drawers and the disks and keep the data separate, but you can actually run HIPAA compliant storage on the same device as we're doing basic research. You just have to be careful not to mix the storage. Okay, so this is the, the latest um, thing that we've been working on. And this started, actually, um, we, our first entree into cloud was something called the experimental uh, TerraGrid MATLAB cluster. So we, uh, people probably don't know this, but uh, the first version of parallel MATLAB was actually developed at then with the Theory Center, now it's the Center for Advanced Computing, by a guy named John Zolweg, who just recently retired and actually still does consulting for MathWorks. Um, and we knew with the new MDCS, how many people know about MDCS? Okay, a few of you. What it is is basically, if you know how to use MATLAB on your laptop, you can just basically in one command automatically be using a parallel cluster somewhere else that you don't have to know about, and it's true utility computing. You just say set sched CAC, and then the next time you launch your job, it sends the processes over the wire and, um, and um, runs in parallel, and your results come back just as if you were running it locally on your laptop or your desktop, okay? So people loved it. It was saturated. But the problem is um, it was an STCI grant, and after two years, we didn't get any more funding. So people came to me and said, oh, don't kill it, don't kill it, we need it. And so we actually launched it as our first external service. So we actually have internal rates for Red Cloud with MATLAB and external rates, which just have our rate plus indirect, okay? And um, Hub Zero has subscribed to this. We go on a subscription model. I'll talk about why. Um, and so you, if you're using Hub Zero uh, and some of this, the hubs, and you need MATLAB on the back end for simulation, some of that could actually run and is running now on Red Cloud with MATLAB. So we have infrastructure as a service today, which is IIS. We went with Eucalyptus, why? Because the lead horse is Amazon, whether you like that or not. And we wanted 100% API compatibility, and that's what Eucalyptus has offered us. Um, people say, yeah, 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 but they have two code bases. Not anymore, that ended up two years ago. And they've been tremendous to work with. Um, and it, it just works, that's what we wanted. Because again, if things require a development team, I'm screwed. People don't want computer science projects. They do that in the CS department. They want to get their work done. So, um, and then we, I told you a little bit about the cloud storage, which is EBS, and now this archival storage. Okay, so what was the motivation? Um, and some of this will ring true. So, um, research computing means many different things to many different people. If you're talking about tightly coupled, InfiniBand, parallel file system, don't go to the cloud. That's not what you use it for. And cloud is not a silver bullet. But if you have to do high throughput workflows, you don't need something for very long. It's like when you go to take your kid back to college at the, at the beginning of the semester, do you go out and buy a U-Haul or do you rent one, right? And so the idea is you, you get it when you need it and you don't pay for it the rest of the time. Um, and so cloud is part of the solution for that. And we actually believe that connecting to other CI resources is really important and cloud is, can be part of those workflows. Um, and the key thing that we found was that nobody likes bad surprises. So I was uh, the vice provost for research who I work for was giving a faculty seminar, um, and one of the faculty that I thought we were supporting stood up and said, we've moved everything to Amazon, and everything is wonderful, and we do all our computing on Amazon, and we're doing tightly coupled simulations. And I'm like, this doesn't sound right. So, so after the talk, I went up to him and said, so... Tell me about the tightly coupled stuff. How are you getting, dealing with the latency issues and the oversubscript? 
we're not really running yet. And I said, okay, thank you. <laughs> so I said, you're going to have to think about those things. Um, but the people that did actually run, so some of the people doing sequencing, some of the people doing life sciences, and this was before spot instances, okay? They were coming back and saying, God, I got a nasty bill that I wasn't expecting for moving data in and out. Okay, I knew what I was paying for computing. I didn't realize what I was paying in IOPS and things like that. And nobody likes that. And when we had our first cluster, back going back to the beginning of the CAC, it was pay as you go. You could, you could basically, you know, but the faculty hated it. And the reason they hated it was they were afraid their grad students were going to go hog wild on the weekend and they were going to come into a $10,000 bill. So they wanted some way to bound financial risk. So we went to a subscription model and we said, we'll sell you chunks in $500 chunks. So it turns out $500 and actually it's going to go down to $400 in July per core year. So that's five cents a core hour um, is what we charge for Red Cloud uh, IIS. And um, people like that because they knew that the worst exposure they had was $500 and they could let all their grad students on at once. Um, so that was good. And they, so there was very little risk there. Um, the geographically distributed resource for disaster recovery is something I'm going to talk about in a moment. Um, bursting is important. That's one of the big uses. But the other thing is not having to wait. So this, this, this sense of elasticity and sort of instant gratification is an important concept that the cloud provides that it's only going to get better. So the other thing I wanted to tell you is that um, in my position and probably in many of your positions, if the vice provost calls you in and says, Dave, the faculty are asking me why we need the Center for Advanced Computing. They keep telling me there's this thing called the cloud. Uh, what about that? Should we just move to the cloud? And if my answer is, don't worry, the cloud sucks, I'm done, right? So what we did was we launched a pilot of this to really find out what it was good at and what it wasn't good at. And we got the faculty involved. And then you can actually have an intelligent conversation because you can say, here's why certain faculty need the kinds of resources they do, and here's, why they, and here's where they don't, and cloud would work just fine. And it turned out that, again, if you can provide an economy of scale in-house, you're better off to do it. So if you can keep your own private cloud busy 80% of the time, it's way cheaper than doing it at Amazon. But if you can't, that's when you have to think about it. Okay, and so again, the model that we like is called the hybrid cloud. It's why we went with Eucalyptus. That's what they've partnered with Amazon to provide is pro uh, production quality hybrid cloud. So you take the same VM, you're running in Ithaca, and now you need to burst 10,000 cores. You can instantly move it over to Amazon and run. That was an important capability. And I actually believe that in time, all the vendors will align. It's like Linux, right? There was so many different flavors of Linux. Everybody had their favorite. And there was FreeBSD, and there was this, and there was that. And everyone would go to meetings and talk about how great their kernel was. And that's normal, and that's where cloud is right now in sort of the cloud platform. It's going to take a while for this to shake out. And the lead horses are going to, are going to you know, dominate. You've got to track them. But it doesn't mean they're going to always win out. So, so that's important. Um, so some of the other things that were really important is we want, a lot of people wanted one core to run a wiki. They didn't want to buy a server and have it sit. Or they wanted to have a place where their group could log in and know that everything was pre-installed correctly and they knew they could get the work done and the data was going to be available and things like that. The other interesting thing that's happening is in education and training, and this turns out to be a really huge, I think, important new area for, cl uh, for cloud. You hear a lot about MOOCs today. You hear about digital textbooks. What's the next logical thing? Being able to do your labs in, the, in all digital, right? From wherever you're at, in the dorm, in Starbucks, whatever. And so if you, instead of telling the students, oh, you have to install all this software on your laptop and make it work, or you're not going to get through the class, you can just say, hey, remote desktop into this virtual system. Everything's pre-installed. This is the way it'll be when you get to the workplace. Um, that's what they want. And so you can really efficiently provide those, those lab environments without having to put workstations all over the place and things like that. So um, that was our motivation, which was long-winded, but you can see we were motivated. Um, and so what we have now is something that provides predictable. Predictable is important. We don't oversubscribe the resource. So when you get a, an instance on with however many cores you want in Red Cloud, you know, the next time you get it, it's going to perform the same way. You're not going to be dealing with less memory, less bandwidth, different processors, things like that. And we publish all the data. Um, it's convenient. There's no hidden costs. We don't charge for network traffic, and that includes our external customers. So that's 10 gig connectivity from the outside world all the way into the actual Red Cloud instances. Um, so uh, 
we have IIS, SAS, and then I told you about the storage. You can do web dev. People have built web dev on top of Red Cloud to serve their data out from the DDN to their groups. That's fine. Um, the other thing that we provide is expert help. So if you're running a production service and you uh, call Amazon or Microsoft or whatever for help in the cloud, you're going to have a hard time getting it. And if we provide that at Cornell and if you provide it locally, you're going to help your users be more successful using the cloud. So um, that's, that's what we provide. This is sort of our instance types. Um, so you can have up to 12 core with 48 gig of memory. But then recently, um, there's um, AMD servers that have 64 core and a half a terabyte of memory. And I think, what is it? 18 gig of disk, local disk. And you can get two of them for 18K. Do the math. That's pretty cheap per core hour. And especially if you're doing sequencing, that's a lot of memory. That's 16 gig per core. So this, this whole chart might change come next summer. But th that's, again, we're sort of following the market, the volume market, and, and being able to leverage that for our cost. OK, so here's the MATLAB story. We actually got an IDC Innovation Award for this one. Um, so we have three different things. We have um, NVIDIA GPUs. And people think, eh, GPUs, I don't want to learn CUDA. I, I can't even get the faculty to move off Fortran. Why would they do CUDA? And the, the beauty of MATLAB is they've optimized a lot of their toolboxes to use the GPUs for you. So all you have to do is declare an array, a GPU array, instead of a standard array. And magically, it all happens on the GPUs, and you get better performance. You can go in and get your hands dirty and write CUDA if you want, but you don't have to. And so that's where I think a lot of these things have to get, so that the average person can use them effectively. And, and by average person, I don't mean my mom or my dad who you know, don't know a laptop from a tablet. I'm talking about scientists that care about their science and not about the latest computing uh, tricks. Um, we have a quick queue. This was specifically to support uh, Hub Zero. So they, you know, they can't get queued up and wait for results. They want, they want fast turnarounds. So we have a uh, queue that we can expand and contract to let um, jobs come in really quick. They have like a two minute limit. Um, and so this is available today. Um, you, you, um, you have to get the MATLAB client with Parallel Compute Toolbox. So it turns out at Cornell and a lot of institutions, we have a, a campus site license, so that is about $200 a seat. And then you pay a subscription to get the MDCS through Red Cloud, and you can run up to, uh, right now, up to like 96 way, but we'll, we're looking at growing that. So that's our Red Cloud story. Um, and so here's, um, here's sort of the future things that we're looking at. And um, I'm sure you all heard about Hurricane uh, Sandy. And our, our med school is right on the East River, and it's amazing that we survived. I can't believe that we, the, the, if anyone knows Manhattan, the water was over the FDR and almost up to our doorstep on York Avenue. But we didn't, we didn't have problems. NYU did not fare so well. They lost pretty much everything at their med school. And um, so we, various med schools got involved to try to help NYU out of a jam. Um, because they had patients and things like that. It was not about competition at that time. Um, <coughs> but they all realized we've got a real problem here, right? The climate's not getting any cooler. The water level's rising. The hurricane patterns have definitely shifted. Two years in a row, they had hurricanes in Manhattan, um, Sandy being the bad one. Um, and so they said, we got to prepare for this. So um, wearing my med school hat, we said, OK, we've got to do a couple things quick. One thing is we've got to extend our secure firewalled network to Ithaca, which is far enough out of the hurricane zone. So there's Rhodes Hall in Ithaca. Uh, the picture in the middle is the medical school on York Avenue. And right across the street is this new Belfer Research Building. And that's important because um, that's where um, Cornell is planning to do things like personalized medicine, um, which is going to require massive sequencing and um, very, very secure data for obvious reasons. We said we've got to get a colo facility for this stuff um, so that critical infrastructure can come up fast and um, we can also burst for research if we need it. So this is sort of the picture, the cartoon of how this works as of this week. Um, we basically did GRE tunneling from a Cisco switch in, at Weill Cornell Medical College in Manhattan. So the red, the red cloud around WCMC means it's firewalled. Ithaca is not firewalled. Ithaca is a wide open network. It's up to the departments and the different, different groups to firewall where they need it firewalled. 
So <clears throat> we ran a separate private subnet inside Ithaca. That's the while extension and the tunnel to there. And so basically what you have is looks, feels, administers everything just like it was in Manhattan. Okay, so now you need a data way to move the data back and forth, and we're using Globus Online for that. And so the beauty of this is that if the only route to move the data is from that, through that GRE tunnel, and Globus says, send the data from A to B, you know it's gonna take that secure path. The other thing, because of the way Globus Online works, the data doesn't flow through Amazon, it flows direct. So you know that you have security. So this is really important, and it turns out the med school had this problem before I got there. They really didn't understand basic research computing versus clinical. And frankly, they didn't care because clinical's where the money's at. So they were charging $13,000 a terabyte per year to store your data at the med school because that's what you need by the time you have Iron Mountain and everybody else involved to have all the replicas to keep your patient data secure. But that doesn't work for someone who's doing um, sequencing on mice, right? So what we did was we, we got Globus Online working and they actually bought disks on our DDN and they've been moving data back and forth as, a, as their, actually in some cases, the primary storage from Manhattan. Okay, so that's that. And so the next logical step was doing, extending that and saying, well, now we need a HIPAA compliant Red Cloud. How do we do that? And so um, we're working on this. This is not done yet but we're hoping to have it done by fall, by the time the Belfer Research Building opens in January of next year. So there's this group called the New York Genome Center. This is sort of like New York's answer to the Broad. And all of these institutions on the, on the right there are members, charter members that paid in to start this. It's gonna be a massive sequencing center. When they were planning the building, I met with the, 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 the project managers and I said, where are you gonna do the computing? And they said, Manhattan, and I said, that's insane. You know, I said, uh, power's twice as much as it is in Ithaca. I don't even want to get into real estate. FTEs are ridiculous in, in Manhattan compared to Ithaca. So this is, you know, you could put some stuff here, but you shouldn't put everything here. And I said, why not, you know, why not think about putting it upstate in Ithaca? And they said, where's that? And I said, oh, this is not going to be good. Um, so, so uh, lo and behold, uh, they stopped talking to me for a while, and then I found out that, oh, they hired a technical director, and guess where they're doing all their computing? Amazon. That's close to, that's close to Manhattan. So anyway, um, the good news is that Eucalyptus ties to that nicely. They have the workflows, they have the VMs, they can run locally, we can show them how to do it. So um, what we're going to do is that each, and we're starting with NYU because they're in need, and we're actually talking possibly about doing this with uh, the University of Chicago folks as a starter, is that every site behind their firewall would set up their own little cloud that they can keep busy most of the time, okay? And therefore, they have the best economies of scale, and they're behind their firewall, and they have this warm fuzzy that everything's cool. What they'd like to be able to do is burst securely somewhere else for disaster because a hurricane's coming down the pike, or because they simply have a heavy workload and they can't meet it with, and they don't want to stand up the capital to meet it because it's going to sit idle most of the time. So. We're, we're, gonna, we're showing them how to build red clouds behind their firewall, which is essentially a secure red cloud. And then, um, and this also is important for obvious reasons, data locality issues and things like that. Um, and, uh, you know, you could actually see a, a time where even the administrative, the, you know, the hospital and the medical school administration stuff might leverage the research infrastructure for bursting in the event of a hurricane, right? You kick off the researchers doing sequencing for a week until the storm settles so that you can keep uh, payroll up, for example. Um, and so initially this has really been going on between NYU and, and, um, and Cornell, um, but we're, you know, we, our goal would be to expand to all the high performance computing for biomedical research institutions. That's quite an acronym. Um, okay, so how does that look? Looks similar, um, and we're actually talking to the Globus Online team. Um, so what we see is that everybody has their own little private cloud running the same software stack, having VMs that we all create together so we have a standard collection that you can hand off. They don't have to be identical, but we could have a suite that people could grab and use. They don't want to build their own. Trust me, doctors don't want to do that. Um, and they would have to um, somehow VPN into a secure bursting resource, perhaps at, in Ithaca, perhaps in Amazon. Key here is signing the BAAs. It's not technical, 
it's, it's uh, legal is the issue. And so um, we're starting to work through those issues. What does it take for NYU and Cornell to agree that we can share a cluster, if you will, we can agree to have our IRBs be independent, and we can make sure the researchers don't have any easy access to data they shouldn't have access to. So we're working through that. And one of the interesting things that is even independent of that is we'd like to be able to move the data around using Globus Online. And what we'd really like to see happen is that data move encrypted, right? And actually be stored encrypted so that when you get there, you see encrypted blobs, but if you have the right keys that you maintain, you can access it and use it, okay? So that's where we're headed with um, Red Cloud Secure. And uh, I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you for your time. So any questions for our speaker? The, the biggest users today are people doing sequencing, um, uh, typically in plant biology. And, and the reason is that they can, set, they can give their student a $500 subscription and they basically go wild and they know that they're not going to run up any bigger bill than that. The other advantage is that all their data is local and it's, we can mount it. So the other thing we can do in Red Cloud that you can't really do in Amazon is if you're paying for storage on the DDN, we'll NFS mount it to your cloud images for you. So you don't have to do EBS if you don't want. Yeah, I, like I said, it's, it's, you know, it's what we did. I'm not saying it would work for everybody, for sure. <laughs> yep. Yep, I have. Oh. Did everybody hear the question? Okay, so the question was, your success is probably unusual. Fair enough. Have you given this talk to other, talks to other CIOs and VPRs to see what they think? And um, the second question is, what are the mistakes that other people are making that they could do better to make this work? So I um, can't remember what, maybe three, three or four years ago, we held an NSF workshop at Cornell called uh, uh, Sustainable Business Models for Academic Research Computing. And if you go to uh, my website, www.tccornell.edu slash Totalifka slash SRCC, and if you can't remember that, I'll tell you afterwards. Um, all the papers and presentations are there. That's the meeting that I mentioned yesterday where Dan Atkins was at it, and there was a lot. There was uh, 78 CIOs and VPRs from across, and center directors from across the country that met and said, what do we do? And that's where they, they said, what we really need to do is measure cost avoidance. That was one of the big gotchas, right? Because it's easy to say cost savings, but cost avoidance is big. And how do you do that? So you can't, every time some faculty member st stuffs a cluster under their desk, you'd have to have the, you know, the network police go out and count those, right? Um, that's not easy. Um, this, is a, this is a growing challenge. So when we did this, people said, you're nuts. It'll never happen. You'll never recover. People won't pay. And then you heard the story from Michigan yesterday who have done even further. They're, they're recovering for power and, and cooling, right? We're not. So more and more schools are faced with this. The good news is that Sustainability 2, the sequel, is going to be this fall at the CASC meeting. So again, a plug for CASC, where we're going to get that same group. We're going to hopefully bring the VPRs and CIOs back and say, Five years later, where are you? Where's your model? How has it evolved? You went from having a shared cluster to no shared cluster. Why? You now have cloud. Why? You now use Globus Online. Why? How do you handle archive? How do you handle big data? All those things bring those back up. So what did we do that was different than other people? Um, number one is the faculty will always say it won't work. So if you believe that, you're dead. Day one, forget it. Just pack up your bags and go home. If you're getting it free or subsidized, you're not going to get them to say anything different. So you have to have institutional buy-in. It has to be from the top down with the dean saying, this is how it shall be. Don't come and ask me for a data center. I'm going to send you. So it turns out um, one of the former associate directors of the center was getting his cluster run for free for Cornell for years. And he was really pissed. He still barely talks to me um, when we met to this model because it meant he was going to have to pay $10,000 a year for his cluster. Okay. It's cheap compared to grad students, and that means maintenance, everything, hardware, the whole thing. So uh, he went to his dean, 
and said, I'm moving it out. I'm going to central computing. Give me the money. And he said, nope, I'm only going to give you the money if you let CAC run it. And so he did. And it worked. And lo and behold, gosh, he was happy. And he just turned it off. You know, like 10 years later, that cluster just got turned off. So you have to have that commitment. If you don't, if there's a way to work around you, they will. Number two, and this is huge, and this is where I'm really intrigued by the Michigan model, um, you have to be cheaper than grad students, and you have to be better than grad students. So cheaper is hard to do, but if you have a subsidy, you can do it. But better is, is uh, a challenge, right? So it, it, the thing you can easily convince faculty is the next time they're sick and your cluster doesn't work, they won't be there, but we will. We're not students, we're staff, we're, you know, we're professional, we'll be there. And they start to slowly get it. And the other thing that's, that's changed is Cornell is at this influx point where the faculty's turning over. And a lot of the old faculty are leaving and we're getting a big influx of new junior faculty and they're used to this. They're used to paying for cloud services, they're used to paying for things and they don't care. The old faculty are like, no, I gotta feel the hot air blowing on my legs and I gotta go hug my cluster and have my group picture taken around my cluster. And it's like, in fact, like, I don't care, you take care, I don't ever wanna see it. Right? And so that helps a lot because we have a huge turnover. And, that, and I think that'll, and the other thing that's gonna happen is as models like ours and Michigan's and others become successful, trust me, the CIOs and VPRs, they see each other at conferences. Word gets out and it'll help. But it's slow and it's the start. And um, so I don't have a silver bullet for you, but I think that's what's helped us. I'm sorry, the first question? You, you said before running it full scale, you had a, 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 no, no, a okay. pilot case first. No, okay, so the question was, how long do we run in pilot phase before we went to full scale? So we, okay, so I, I was misleading, let me clarify. The model was never pilot. When we went to cost recovery, we said, come fiscal year 09, we're charging. Bring your wallet or stay home. And it was that, it was it. And then they said, well, what can I get for free? Five minutes on the phone. Right, that was it. Don't, don't send your grad students over, you know, and so, but what we did say we piloted was Red Cloud, and so this is part, and so this is important. You need to have enough flex built into your model, and the subsidy can be used for this, so you can innovate. If you don't innovate, and you don't provide new services that faculty want, before they know they need them, you're dead. And so we did pilot it in the back room, and we let some crazy faculty on to tell us why it was stupid. And then when they go, oh, this isn't so bad, then we said, okay, it's time to release it. It was that we could meet a price point. That, okay, so what was the success measured with Red Cloud when we decided to go from pilot to product? Two things. The price point was one the faculty said they would pay. And number two was the faculty were happy that they were, could get real work done on it. And they knew that if they needed a little hand-holding, we would do it. So those, you know, and so you know, everybody's different. I'm not trying to stand up here and tell you we did it exactly right. Everybody's, but, you know, we have a little bit of a success story there. Uh, very interesting talk, Dave. Uh, Thank I'm you. just curious about what are you finding uh, from users about, you know, accepting charges for data? Computing to some extent is a little bit ahead of the curve. People can, you know, think yeah. about paying for computing. What about data? That's and a great question. So everyone so heard the question. Just one um, more thing. And then if people are paying for data, what are the sources they are tapping? Because yep. money is flowing from somewhere. Yep. Right? So what so, are you advising people to get money for for that sort of thing? It, you know, you're spot on. Your questions are spot on. Um, so. So, you know, I remember when the NSF data management requirement came out and every faculty member I knew just started pounding their fist on the desk going, another goddamn unfunded mandate, I won't do it. And I said, yeah, it's funded. <laughs> There's, you know, you can write it into your grant, but the problem is, here's the problem that everyone wants to ignore, is you have to convince that faculty member that that investment from their grant funds, which are limited, is actually gonna help them versus another grad student working on the science. And so you go, I've been to a lot of these data management talks. You've, there's one every week, I think. And the thing that I find is they're over, there's at least 50% of the crowd is librarians. Okay, and that's great because I think metadata and curation is an important thing. But the, the, the elephant we're all dancing around in the room and not addressing is cost 
And what's the value proposition? If you can't show Joe the physicist that by making his data, you know, providing metadata and curating the data and making it available to the community is going to help his research or her research, guess, guess how enthusiastic they're going to be, even if they have the money. So there's a lot of work to be done on building those compelling cases. Now, the other part is driving the price down. So, you know, if you can build the right economies of scale, for example, right now the ideal price point is $100 a terabyte. By the time I get home, it'll be 10, um, but that's, that's the reality. Um, if you can do that, um, you start to at least make the, the, the possibility of being able to do it at a reasonable price possible. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's a very fast-changing game, and it scares the hell out of me, but uh, you, we have to deal with it. And I think that the truth is that you can write it into your grants. I did a survey, I don't have time to talk about it today, but I did a survey for the National Science Foundation on how researchers are using cloud. There's gonna be a report coming out um, in July that everyone can get access to, it's for Exceed. Um, and, you know, um, the, it's, it's you know, talking about uh, all the different services that people used. And, one of the th and we asked people what are the challenges and they said, you can't write it into your grant. And every NSF program director said, that's not true, that's an educational issue, it is. But you have to know how to say it, right? And it's not just, I need it, right? Like that uh, AT&T commercial, I want more, I want more. No, it's gotta be, why do you need that versus exceed resources, versus a cluster, versus what makes that the right thing for your science? You have to be able to explain it. And I think if you do that, the money will come. Now, the long-term archival problem is a real challenge. And the key there has gotta be, long-term value for your institution if they're gonna put money to make some data collection available through your library, for example. And you know, maybe there's foundations that'll pay for that. It's, it's not there yet, but it's gonna be interesting. So I wish I had a better answer, but that's where we're at. Yeah. Yeah, I'd like to go down that answer a little more. So sure, please. The question I come to when I go to these guys, can you reproduce the data and do we really need to hang on to it? Yep. A, if you can't reproduce it, we need to hang on to it, how long? Are you going to manipulate it and then write your paper? And now I want to put it somewhere out there yep. so people can get to it and get rid of it. No, that's a great point. Okay. Yep. Yeah, Raleigh. Yeah. How, how do you determine that your model is working, that is successful? In the case of... Well, so it's real easy. I'm recovering 80% of my costs or I'm laying people off. <laughs> and number two, my user base is growing. And if I don't demonstrate both of those every year, I have to have a heart-to-heart -heart with my boss, which I don't like having. But is cost recovery the only really factor? No, that no, you're no, no. So I only cost recover if I'm serving users. So the number of users and the diversity of the users I'm serving is my number one objective. So they have to, if my boss catches some faculty member in the hall and says, hey, how's it going? Is the CAC helping you? And they say, that thing's a piece of garbage. They don't help me at all. I'm in trouble. But if they say, yeah, they're fantastic. They help us. Or, or they say, I didn't know about it, but I'm glad you told me I'm going to call them. Those are good stories, and those are the ones we're shooting for. Do you, do you track anything that measure that you're positioning your faculty to be more... Uh, Very subjective, because here's why. Unfortunately, high-performance computing has become the library. If you don't have it, you're lost. It's not special anymore. It's not like, oh, we have this big cluster, so we're special in research. Not really. You know, and, and, not, and you don't necessarily need a gigantic one anymore. You need one that's right for your research. And so that's not a compelling story. It's very hard to make the argument that we're helping attract and retain faculty by having a big resource. I would say it's more attractive to say, we have staff that can help you do the dirty work that you don't want to do. And that's really the primary focus of our recovery model is the consulting. So I'm not trying to poo-poo anyone's model that has clusters. Listen, I get it, there's different models, but at Cornell that doesn't work for us. Anyone else? Yeah. Um, Am I way over? No. Probably, I'll try not to. So, no, that's okay. Uh, so I'm wondering from an archive perspective, so one of the things you talked about was unexpected costs. And so from you know looking at Glacier, if you would need to pull that data yeah. out, there would be an unexpected cost. Yep. And so I was wondering if you know a possible leverage model is to look at the institutions that have already invested in tape archive systems having MOUs and things like yep. this, so you have cross-institutional usage of those resources. No, it's a good point. And the other thing that I should add is that, so it makes a great point that there's people out there with infrastructure that have economies of scale, and we do leverage that. We have central IT that has a huge tape library, and we can leverage it. It turns out it's not as cheap as disk anymore. But if you need tape, that's, I'm not gonna reproduce that and charge more for it. The interesting thing that's happened, and this goes back to, what data do you store? There's, there's disciplines that have this nailed. 
Social scientists storing census data, they know how to do this. Astronomers, they already know how to do this. High energy physicists, they have models. Now, they're always looking for a low cost alternative, but they have models, and so we have to learn from them. The other disciplines have to learn from them, and we have to learn as service providers what can we do to help them. Um, so it's going to get better. We're, you know, the big data thing is, is the new thing. Cloud is sort of its infancy, too, I think. Um, but these are new opportunities, and so a partnership's huge. You have to partner. Um, I actually think um, we might get into a model where instead of having university libraries, we'll have commercial libraries, where if you have data that's value, they'll want it. This, why, does, why does Amazon put the 1,000 genomes on Amazon for free? Because they want you to come buy cycles. Right? So if you can build a business model around storing data and making it available, we could have commercial libraries that the institutions just subscribe to. So this is, you know, will it happen? I don't know, but a lot of interesting technology is, gonna, is disruptive, in, and I think disruptive in a good way right now. But it, it, the jury's still out. I don't know how it's going to pan out. Thank you very much. Thank you.